Thank you very much, Bente. First of all, can you hear me okay? Is the sound okay for everyone? Okay, great. Uh, so it's lovely to see people. Most of you haven't got your video on, so I can't see your faces, but I'm sure you're there. Um, <laughs> oh, that's nice. Now I can see some people. That's lovely. And uh, I feel very humbled and privileged to be in the company of such distinguished uh, Venerable Bhikkhus and also the Venerable Bhikkhuni Ratna, who's just been uh, speaking to you all. I unfortunately couldn't follow because I have yet to learn Sinhala, so that will have to follow, I'm afraid. But um, I wanted to share some Dhamma today. Um, I'm presuming that you've all heard about um, the Venerable Arahata Sangamitta's story throughout the day, and I'm not the expert on that story. Um, so I thought I'd offer some practical Dhamma, which uh, you may be familiar with, because many of you have known me for a while. Um, for those who haven't known me for very long, or maybe haven't come in contact with me, um, I ordained in Burma in 2004, originally, and then again in 2006. And um, at that time I'd been practicing Vipassana in the Goenka tradition for about 10 years. And my whole understanding and approach to the meditation had been through that particular method. And I'd gained great benefits, you know, by learning to observe everything in terms of the three characteristics, especially the characteristic of impermanence. And we really focused on looking at Vedana, you know, the experience of um, mostly physical bodily sensation um, in terms of its impermanent nature. And looking back now at how my practice has progressed or evolved over the years, I feel that one of the main um, distinguishing elements is that at that time the focus was quite object-oriented, so it was very much about what I was experiencing and how it was manifesting. But now I feel that over time my focus has become much more attitude-oriented, so that the orientation is more about not so much what's arising, or even how it's arising, but how I'm relating to whatever it is that I experience from time to time, whether that be in daily life or in meditation on the cushion. Yeah, because practice is not only about meditating on the cushion, it's about everything we do with our body, speech and mind. And I find that this way of practice is really beautiful because we always have a choice as to what we put between ourselves and our experience. And that comes back to the Buddha's teaching on the um, second factor of the Noble Path, the teaching on right intention, or as my teacher Ajahn Brahm describes it, as right motivation. So it's about where you're coming from rather than what you're looking at. And sometimes even more important than the goal itself in the sense that if we're always focusing on goals and on outcomes, sometimes we're not aware about whether we're relating to this moment skillfully or not. And we're looking for our happiness in the future. You know, We're putting all our efforts into um, cultivating a happier state later on. <laughs> and sometimes we can forget what we're doing now. And we can forget to notice how much joy, how, much, um, how many blessings we already have in our lives. You know, how much we already have, even in the contents of our mind, to be grateful for, you know. So we're starting to turn our mind away from being so fault-finding and so kind of um, focused on what we can get, what we can gain, how we can improve, how we can improve our meditation, improve our relationships, improve ourself, and much more about how we can learn to really value and appreciate what we already have, yeah. And this is really radical. This is a really radical shift in our understanding. And for me, it's the place I constantly work at, you know, because we can always refine that quality of awareness, quality of relationship that we're having with whatever's arising in the present. So that's how my practice has sort of changed over the years. And um, so I put a lot of emphasis now on kindness on letting go and on uh, making peace with all of experience, the three right intentions. Also um, non-cruelty, the intention of being gentle, having a harmless um, relationship with those around us and a harmless relationship with our mind. 
Yeah. So I wanted to talk today a little bit about those three right intentions in the form of letting go. So that's the uh, right intention of nikkama, otherwise translated as renunciation. Yeah. And um, there's different ways you can sort of frame that because sometimes the word renounce, especially to Westerners and also to lay people, can sound almost a little bit threatening, like renounce, just what, give up everything that I hold dear, everything that's precious to me. I can't just renounce, you know, just like that. But another way of understanding that term is also a kind of um, loosening of the grip that we have on things, loosening this sense of clinging, yeah? Letting things be, letting things actually be without trying to push them away or seek to possess or hold on to them. Um, another one that I really like is um, thinking of letting go or renouncing as making peace with whatever's arising, making peace with the moment, making peace with our mind, yeah, making peace with whatever arises from, from time to time, rather than fighting it and arguing with it and saying, yeah, it shouldn't be this way, right? How much suffering do we have when we say things shouldn't be the way they are? Because they can only be the way they are, there can't be any other way. Everything that's arisen right now has arisen through causes. Yeah? We're experiencing the effects of some of those causes in this moment. So you can't argue with that. You know? In a sense, everything is exactly as it has to be. But what we can do is not add on negativity to that experience, not make bad karma with perhaps the bad karma results that we experience now. So instead we can make peace, we can actually see how am I relating to this and how can I relate in a way that softens my experience, that softens the craving and that leads to that sort of grasping, you know, if you think of grasping, clinging as like a hand, how can we just like just relax the grip a little bit and give things space to be, just give things space so that we can see them and understand from them, learn from them, right? So letting go doesn't mean, um, it doesn't mean rejecting experience, it doesn't mean pushing it away or um, trying to get something better, because they, those kind of attitudes carry a sense of aversion, you know, wanting to turn away from things. The Buddha's path is always about turning towards suffering, turning towards our experience. And it's really important that we learn how to turn towards things skillfully, yeah? Again, not with an attempt to get them away or, or hold on to them, but just to stay with them, to stay with them, so that we can be present for long enough that their nature starts to unfold to us. We can start to see more deeply into the nature of things. Yeah. So I think especially for people perhaps who don't come from Buddhist backgrounds, sometimes we have this tendency to come to the path because we feel that there's something maybe wrong with us or you know, something we um, need to change. And in a sense, that's true because we suffer. So, of course, we want to change suffering to happiness. But the mistake can sometimes be that we, we miss a critical step. We want to let go of things, move beyond things, before we've really met those things in ourselves, those things that we um, don't really respect or like, or even things like trauma, traumatic things that we perhaps haven't reconciled with, you know. We want to kind of uh, uh, come to the path to transcend those things. But the only way we can really transcend them is to meet them first of all. So the Buddha said that there is suffering, and suffering has to be understood. Parinyata bam. It should be understood pari. That means all around, completely. So we have to first understand things before we can really let them go. So how can contentment help us to let go? And this is what I really wanted to talk about today. So how contentment can help the letting go and strengthen the letting go. And also how contentment is a product of that letting go. So we're not letting go, as I said, into a void. It's not that we're letting go of everything that's dear to us and we're going to be left with nothing. In fact, the more we let go, the more peace we experience, the more happiness arises. And, and even, you can sometimes experience that joy arises in direct proportion to how much you're able to let go. Yeah. So contentment can be seen as the goal of Buddhism. It can be seen as, you know, a synonym for Nibbāna, right? Nibbānam paramam sukham. Nibbāna is the highest happiness. 
And what kind of happiness is that? That's a contented happiness, a, a happiness that doesn't want for anything. It's completely content in and of itself. There's nothing more missing, there's nothing lacking anymore. And it's an unconditional happiness that doesn't depend on external conditions being just so. But not only is contentment a goal and a quality that we cultivate, it can also be a way of looking at our experience. So as I said, it can be a way of relating to whatever arises. Almost like mindfulness is your eyes, so we become aware of something with our eyes, but then contentment is like the lens in the glass, if you're wearing glasses. Contentment is the lens that you look through. And contentment is very powerful because it has this effect of um, undermining what we call the hindrances to meditation, the five hindrances that can get in the way of clear seeing. So it's a way of looking and it's a very beautiful way of looking that carries with it a lot of peace and a wholesome kind of happiness. Because the Buddha didn't say that we should shun happiness. He actually said that pleasure is something to cultivate. But um, in the Majjhima Nikaya, Arana Vibhanga Sutta, 139, for any sutta heads here, um, he actually says we should know how to define pleasure. And knowing that, we should pursue the pleasure that's within ourselves. And he defines that kind of pleasure as completely different from the pleasure of the senses. Yeah. So he says that the pleasure of the senses is basically fraught with um, like a kind of fever, because we're so desperate to kind of experience pleasure through our senses and we can get, you know, into arguments, we can get into jealousy, there can be this kind of crazy craving for more and more pleasure and after a while the pleasures that we used to enjoy just aren't good enough, you know, we need to have something more intense, um, the rewards are not so much and also we get dependent on those pleasures, right, so that when they're not there, say, um, I don't know, the internet goes out, which mine almost did before this talk, <laughs> it actually uh, crashed for about five minutes, um, suddenly we don't know what to do because we're used to checking our emails at a certain time or scrolling through Facebook or even listening to a Dhamma talk, right? These become sort of dependencies for us and so we're happy when we have them but when they're not there we suffer more, even more than we, we would have been without them in the first place. So the, the right kind of happiness that the Buddha did praise was the happiness of meditation. And in that sutta, he defines that as the happiness of the deep samadhi, the four jhanas. And he says that these pleasures are to be cultivated, are to be pursued and developed, and are not to be feared. And the reason for that is because these are pleasures of letting go. They're pleasures born of letting go. They're not pleasures that we can strive for and seek to hold on to and attain. You know, if you have... Um, practice samadhi to any depth, you can see in the process that the process is one of letting go <clears throat> of the sense of self by, by degrees. So first we let go of a very coarse sense of self, like the kind of idea that I'm here and I have a lack that I need to fulfill and I need to attain something for me. You know, I need to be the one who gets the jhanas or who gets enlightened in this life. So this is a very coarse kind of self, sense of self getting in the way there. But then as we meditate, we also find the subtler aspects of the sense of self that come in, you know, such as the control freak, wanting to stay with the breath at all costs, but then not finding that you can stay with the breath and finding that that breath slips away from your mind. So then we come in and we try harder and we go after that breath and we try and hold on to that breath. And the whole thing becomes a little bit like a fight. It becomes a bit of a struggle because the sense of self is too strong. You're basically doing it from willpower, as my teacher Ajahn Brown says, using willpower instead of wisdom power. And the wisdom power is more focused on putting the causes in place for these things to arise. Yeah, so we actually do the foundation work through our daily life. So what is contentment? I did want to um, just talk about it as a quality, first of all, and before we look at how it can help us in our meditation. And um, the dictionary definition of it, in a, I forget which dictionary, is um, a feeling or a state of deep satisfaction, ease and peace. 
which is very lovely, even just to say those words, you know, feeling deeply satisfied, at ease and at peace, you know, when you want, really want nothing. And it's a sense of things being just good enough the way they are, nothing's lacking, yeah. And you can see how this immediately starts to overcome unrealistic expectations of ourselves and of others, yeah. It's a quality that's more in line with the way things really are. We're contented with things right now. In other words, we notice the beauty of the present moment and we can learn to focus on what's right rather than what's wrong. Yeah. What's actually present rather than what's missing. While I was meditating on my three-month retreat, we monastics always have a uh, rains retreat every year between the full moon of July and October. And in my tradition, in the forest monastery tradition um, of Theravada, we tend to use that opportunity to meditate a lot. So it's a time of solitude and a time of deep practice. And um, I was meditating one day and sort of thinking, yeah, sort of looking for something, you know, just very subtly looking for the bliss to increase in my mind. And then just this phrase popped into my mind, don't look for what's not there, look for what is there. And it was just, I'm sure Ajahn Brahm said that somewhere in a talk, but sometimes these instructions come up just when you need them. And I suddenly realised that there was a lot of peace in my mind, there was a lot to be contented with already, so I didn't need to go anywhere else, you know. And this had the effect of making me much more present, much more receptive, much more open to what was arising right then. I think contentment also carries an aspect of loving kindness with it. Because again, you know, if we can really appreciate and value what's there, we become content with it. When you value somebody, you know, you, you love somebody, right? If you don't value them, they feel rejected. They feel like you don't really care. You don't really appreciate their unique, special qualities. You want them to be different than they are. But when we love someone, we really value who they are. We don't ask for them to be any different. And the same with ourselves. Can we really treat ourselves with that kindness? As if we are our own best friend and value ourselves, become content with who we are, you know, the efforts that we make, our good intentions. Always coming back to intentions because we can't control the outcome of our lives, but we can focus on our intentions, you know. And all of you have beautiful intentions or you wouldn't be here today listening to the Dhamma and spending this time just... Um, taking steps on the beautiful path. So that's enough and we don't need to ask for more. So this contentment is very humbling also. Yeah? And in the Metta Sutta, again, it's uh, equated to loving kindness. It says that one who has loving kindness is humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied. Yeah? Not proud and demanding in nature. So you're not demanding that your partner always do everything right, you know, wake up at the right time, get you a cup of tea in bed. <laughs> Don't do that really annoying habit that you've told them about a thousand times. <laughs> Whatever it is. We don't expect our partners to be perfect or our friends to be perfect and phone us up just at the right time and not in the middle of a talk. <laughs> that did happen to me once. A friend called me in the middle of a talk about three times, actually. So I had to keep hanging the phone up. <laughs> So these things happen and life can't be perfect. So contentment is very realistic. It doesn't ask for perfection from ourselves or from others and it doesn't have this unrealistic expectation that life be perfect. I don't know about people here, but when I first heard the Buddha's teaching, the first thing I heard was the truth of suffering. The Buddha said there is suffering and suffering is to be understood. And he basically covered the whole of life with that definition of suffering. You know, he said birth is suffering, aging, death, old age is suffering. Yeah, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair is suffering. Obviously, right? Psychological suffering as well. And also that being separated from what we like, whether that's a person, whether that's a situation. During COVID, a lot of us are separated from our families. We can't travel as much as we want to. Maybe we can't even do the work that gives us meaning in life. And being associated with what we don't like is a cause for suffering. Right? Also, not getting one's wishes is suffering. Yampicham nalabati tampidukkam. Not attaining one's wishes is suffering. So you can see how contentment can solve all these problems because if we're content with where we are, we're no longer separated from 
what we like. We have what we like. We're content with what's there. Yeah. If we're content, then we're not um, associated with the disliked. We can see the beauty in any emotional state, even emotional states such as loneliness, such as sorrow and sadness. When we learn to hold those with kindness, with loving kindness, we become open. We can even approach them with a sense of curiosity, even wonder. What is this sadness? How does it feel? You know, how can I hold it kindly so that it soothes, so that it, it feels that I'm not rejecting it, you know, that I'm actually able to open and learn from the sadness or from the sorrow in my heart. So it, we can even be associated with the so-called unpleasant things and actually learn not to suffer because of that. So again, we turn those unwanted situations into something which is wanted, which, which we can be content with. Yeah? So we're starting to overcome the truth of suffering through using contentment. It's also a lot warmer than just mere acceptance yeah? or even equanimity. Equanimity is a beautiful quality which should always be infused with loving kindness, compassion and, and sympathetic joy. It's almost an outcome of those three. But sometimes again, and maybe especially in the West, I'm not sure, we can tend to pick up equanimity as this kind of doled out state that's sort of aloof from everything and that's unaffected by the world. And that's true, you know, if we've learned to relate wisely to things, then we won't be so affected in, in negative ways. But we should always be affected by suffering and always be affected by, um, you know, just, just the poignancy of being alive. The fact that we're fragile, the fact that we, you know, human beings and all creatures um, desire their own happiness and recoil from pain. So we need to be touched by this, but then to know the appropriate response, a response which is infused with loving kindness. And to know our limitations so that equanimity, you know, can see that, yes, there are some things that we have to just accept and that we can't um, control. But at the same time, we can do our best yeah, to help relieve suffering wherever and however that may be possible. So contentment is a little bit warmer than acceptance and equanimity because I feel it helps us to get closer to our experience. Like it's a kind of um, way of embracing experience. So it's not just it's good enough. It's actually really okay. Like we can really put a lot of value into each moment and, and kind of snuggle up to the moment. <laughs> Even, like I say, the sorrow and the sadness, can you just really be close with that? Give it company, give it close companionship in your heart, yeah? instead of just pushing it out. And when we can do that, we find a lot of spaciousness and a lot of lightness can come into the relationship, and slowly that starts to free up the suffering. Yeah. So, in the suttas... <laughs> I thought I didn't have much to say, but I've still got quite a lot to say. <laughs> because I did want to talk about how contentment comes into the suttas. And the first place that I found that it appears is in the gradual training. And um, there's a beautiful sutta called the Kandaraka Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, number 51. And you've probably all heard me talk about this many times. But um, it starts off with the basis of right view, you know, the first factor of the noble path. So that basic understanding that all beings suffer and that all beings turn away from um, suffering, you know, they flee from suffering. It actually says they recoil from pain, which I think is a beautiful word. You can see that with animals, even insects, right? Even snakes. We sometimes think if a snake, I don't know how many of you have lived with snakes, I've lived with quite a lot of snakes, uh, you know, they can kind of put their head up and you think, oh, they're on the attack. But actually, they're just recoiling. They're just, you know, scared and frightened of you. And so they're moving away. You know? And if you just leave them alone, they will just disappear. I've seen that so many times. You know, they only have that response if they're startled. So all beings try to move away from suffering. And this is enough of an understanding to engender that compassion and that right motivation to start walking on the path. The motivation to engage with suffering rather than to turn away from it, you know, with indifference or so-called equanimity. Yeah, that's the wrong term for equanimity, of course, but just to say that, you know, sometimes we pick that term up incorrectly because it doesn't mean impartiality. 
So, and from that right view, we undertake the training in virtue. So in this sutta, it's very beautiful because it talks about the precepts, you know, of not killing or um, lying, stealing, sexual uh, misconduct or um, intoxicants. But it also talks about the opposites, the positive aspects of those precepts. And the first one, the opposite of not killing, is to abide um, with rod and weapon laid aside, merciful and compassionate to all beings. And it's just so beautiful, you know, to really reflect on those words, like to abide with mercy, with compassion to all beings. It's, it's much more than simply abstinence. And the same with speech. Speech is a really beautiful one that's described here. I'll see if I can just um, read a few... Is that the right page? Read a few words from there because it's really lovely. So it says here, it's talking about the five, four or five types of speech. So it says that abstaining, sorry, abandoning false speech, one abstains from false speech, speaks the truth, adheres to the truth, is trustworthy and reliable, one who is no deceiver of the world. Yeah? So you can see that's a lot more than just not lying, right? You actually learn to speak the truth. And of course, that's a, a spectrum, right? because we can only speak from our experience, so that truth will be refined increasingly as we practice. Then abandoning malicious speech, one abstains from malicious speech, does not repeat elsewhere what one has heard here in order to divide those people from these, nor does one repeat to these people what they have heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Thus, they are one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of friendship, who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, and a speaker of words that promote concord. Yeah, I'm sure you've all had that experience where there's maybe two of your mutual friends who are fighting and they both come to you and want to say something negative about the other one and you think, what do I do here, you know? Because I can see both sides, I could relate to it, I could agree, or we could just take that step back and think, how can I just bring these people together? Maybe I can remind this one friend of the virtues in the other friend. Say, so, yeah, you know, I know they can be that way sometimes. Maybe they're going through a hard time. You know, I know I can be that way when I'm going through a time of stress or discomfort or whatever it might be, especially maybe when I'm tired, I can be irritable. So perhaps it's the same for that person. And remember these qualities too. Remember how they did this for you or how they were there when you really needed someone to listen, you know. So we can bring people together in this way. We can't force them together, but we can certainly promote concord. Then abandoning harsh speech, one abstains from harsh speech, speaks such words that are gentle, pleasing to the ear and lovable, as go to the heart, a courteous, desired by many and agreeable to many. I think that's so beautiful because there's always something we can do with our speech to show our love and care to others. You know, even small things we can express our gratitude for. Things that you might just think are normal that people do. Well, maybe it wasn't so easy for them to do that today because they might have been going through enormous struggles themselves. You know, and it's amazing sometimes that we can just get up and get through the day. I read somewhere recently someone said, yeah, a successful day is uh, basically waking up, going through the day without harming anyone, you know, intentionally, and going to bed at night. That's a successful day. You know, and in the context of this global pandemic right now, I think there's really a lot of truth in that, isn't there? Because that really puts everything into perspective. You know, we have our life in this moment. You know, we're trying to live as best we can. We make mistakes, and that's okay. In Buddhism, you're allowed to make mistakes. You know, but we can go to bed at night. We've got a roof over our head. Anyone who's here obviously has a home. You're not living in the streets. You know, a lot of people are, and it's winter time now. There are refugees in refugee camps with like little tiny plastic sandals, you know, walking through the snow. We have so much to be grateful for, and gratitude, of course, is another aspect of contentment. But I'll finish about the speech. There's one more here. And the last type of speech to abandon is abandoning gossip. One abstains from gossip, speaks at the right time, speaks what is fact, 
speaks on what is good, speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline. At the right time, one speaks words that are worth recording, reasonable, moderate and beneficial. So there's so much we can do with our speech to bring happiness to others. And in this sutta, the very next um, part of the gradual training, once we become proficient in those precepts, is, is the development of contentment. So it says here that one becomes content with robes to protect their body and arms food to maintain their stomach. And I love this phrase. Wherever they go, they set out taking only these things. Just as a bird, wherever it goes, flies with its wings as its only burden, so too the bhikkhu or bhikkhuni becomes content with robes to protect their body and with arms food to maintain their stomach. And wherever they go, they set out taking only these. Possessing this aggregate of noble virtue, one experiences within oneself a bliss that is blameless, an avajasukha in Pali. So we're already developing a kind of inner contentment based on non-remorse, based on blamelessness. Yeah, being content that we've lived the best of, to our, of our ability. And of course, the more contented we are, the less material we need, the less material support we need. One of the happiest times of my life was even pre-ordination when I used to be in India and I would travel with a tiny little backpack just having once in a while, like my second-hand t-shirts got really grubby and someone would give me a new second-hand t-shirt. <laughs> so I'd have a new one, which was also second or third-hand. And uh, I'd just carry, you know, three or four kilos in my backpack. And, and the reason I could live so simply was because I had a purpose. I had a meaning in my life. I had the purpose, you know, I'd come into contact with the Dhamma and I was doing a lot of Dhamma service. And when we have a purpose, our life has meaning. And for a life which already has meaning, what do we really need materially? Of course we need the basics, the roof, the food, you know, a safe place to be. Yeah, All of us are very fortunate not to live in war-torn countries with, you know, maybe dictatorships or a lot of turmoil. The government might not be perfect, but which government is? You know, at least we have a fairly stable society. Um, so as long as those things are there, I felt so fortunate to be able to just increasingly lighten my load, actually physically lighten my load and just move around with this small backpack. Kind of, uh, it gave me a sense of fearlessness, you know, that no matter what would happen to me in my life, I would always have the Dhamma. And bit by bit, I got the courage to renounce that little bit more. Yeah, so that sort of led to my ordination in Burma. And yeah, we used to sleep on the floor on like a tatami mat, this thick. I mean, it's not really much different from sleeping on the marble floor. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there was a mosquito net in there and a little squat toilet. And at that time, our Dhamma hall didn't even have windows or doors, so the mosquitoes would just be in there. You know, they'd come in especially for the evening meal when we were sitting and meditating. Uh, we didn't even have insect repellent or anything, but I was just so content because after 10 years I'd finally found an opportunity to ordain and I was with my teacher and I was doing the thing that mattered most to me in this life, you know, and it was a time of great contentment even though it was one of the poorest times materially and yet that led to so much of a sense of freedom, freedom from desire and also fearlessness in that I really didn't have very much to lose. I mean, if anybody would have come to try and steal something from me, all they'd have seen was like a, a sweaty robe. And um, I guess my passport was my most precious item. But even that can be replaced. <laughs> so, you know, as we gain in this inner contentment that comes from inside, that comes from our virtue, that comes from our um, simplicity of lifestyle, we can actually really simplify our lives. We might not need to work so much. Or we might be able to take a job that's more aligned to our values. You know, sometimes we stay in jobs because they're giving us a lot of money and they're supporting a certain standard of living, even though we might feel that slightly at odds with our conscious, conscience, you know. I had an email from somebody recently who was um, turning their, uh, I think they were just looking after pawns. I'm not quite sure what they were doing just looking after them, but <laughs> it was only recently that they'd started to um, turn it into a business and, of course, that involved killing and he was really struggling with his conscience around that because initially he had just had these pawns in, in the farm and 
was just kind of giving them a place to live. So I don't think that he's going for that for monetary reasons, but still, you know, the, the more simply we can live, the more choice we have, actually, about what really matters and what kind of livelihood can support our practice. So as I said, it's also part of right intention, but um, I'm going to skip a little bit. I'm not quite sure what the time is because I don't have a clock up here, but uh, just see if I can exit the full screen. Yeah, so, okay. So I want to talk a little bit about how we can use the contentment in our meditation, how that attitude and that way of looking at our experience that arises can help us deepen our practice, and especially our practice of samadhi. Yeah, Because the Buddha said that um, wisdom depends on samadhi, right? Samadhi pachaya yata bhuta jnana samadhi, stillness, those states of mind which are free from the five hindrances are the cause for seeing things as they truly are. Because the five hindrances are defined as obscurations of the mind which weaken wisdom. Yeah, they're like coverings on the mind, but not like this beautiful lens of compassion which helps you to see things in a, a more objective and more open way, but they're coverings that kind of veil the truth. So when we have anger, for example, we just see all the things that we don't like about a situation or about a person. And in meditation, that aversion may be to seeing things like impermanence. We just don't want to see that, you know, everything that I take to be myself is actually subject to change. We just don't want to see that because we're so attached to this thing that we take to be a self. So contentment can help us to overcome these hindrances and so that we can see things more clearly. And when we're content in the moment we tend to move inside it. We tend to be able to sink more deeply inward. Yeah? Because if you think about it, when you're not content, you're always looking onward. You're always looking towards something else. You're looking outside of this moment, towards the future. And this is very subtle in the actual meditation practice. You know, you can be with the breath and you can think that, oh yes, I'm just with one breath. But you're also very subtly anticipating the next breath and the next breath. You're in the flow, so you've got this kind of rhythm going on. And you think you're with the one breath, but actually you're already sort of with the next. And before you know it, the mind's gone somewhere, because you're not quite close enough. But when you have that contentment with this one breath, only one breath is my aim. My, breath, my aim is not to be aware of the breath for one minute or two minutes or two hours. It's to be aware of this breath now with as much contentment and loving kindness as I can possibly generate. And then we can move into that breath and really experience it very deeply and see things in that breath that we haven't seen before. Yeah. So the past and the future start to drop away. When we start to move inward, we also start to move inside of time. Yeah. So the past and the future start to disappear and we become more and more poised in this present moment. So the present moment becomes a kind of um, place to sort of hang. It's almost like you're suspended in the middle of time. And everything becomes very bright. It becomes in sharp relief, so to speak, because you're really there. And when there's no past and future, it's harder for craving and desire, craving and aversion to get involved. Because you can only really crave about things that you imagine in the future, right? You can only really have aversion to sort of, oh, I want something else, or I didn't really want this experience, or my knee's hurting, I want to get out of this meditation now. We can't really crave and be averse if we're really in the present moment, because we're so present, there's almost no space for those things to arise. And especially if you fill that relationship up with compassion, it's almost like a buffer zone for the hindrances. Yeah. Ajahn Brahm has a nice quote. He says that um, uh, contentment is the middle way between desire and ill will. It keeps your attention with the breath for long enough for piti sukha to arise. Piti sukha, again, is contentment, right? The happiness that comes from within. Piti is like a rapture, the sort of... Um, the quality that arises when we really become very interested in what we're doing, we become more and more absorbed in the breath. And then we get this kind of subtle pleasure that can come through the body almost like a wave or it can be like um, a general sense of ease and contentment. So again, you know, he's talking about contentment as a way of looking and also contentment as the result. 
Yeah, so we look at things through the eyes of contentment, but then we experience increasing happiness, increasing inner peace. So this contentment helps us to stay with things for longer. Yeah, it's like a glue that's between you and the object. It, it, it gets you close to it and it, it values the object so much that you're able to stay present for, with it long enough for it to open up. So first of all, it starts to open up and become joyful and then perhaps you might start to experience brightness in the mind. Yeah, And then if you do go into um, deep meditation, into the samadhi states, you can, at that time, the mind is so incredibly bright and still and full of contentment that you really don't move for hours. You know, the mind just doesn't want to move. And later on, when we are free from those um, hindrances, we have a chance to see things as they are. So we have a chance to be content with impermanence, be content with the idea that there's no one in here, there's nothing to permanent, there's no abiding entity that lasts forever within ourselves. But when we can see these kind of truths that the Buddha taught with a lot of contentment, it's much less threatening and it's much less likely to cause a kind of adverse reaction which can happen if we move too fast. Yeah? It's as if we have this resource so that as we let go of one thing, you know, this hold or this attachment to our sense of self, we have something in return. We have this deeper contentment, deeper sense of inner peace. Yeah? So it becomes easier to keep on letting go. So I did want to talk much more about the uh, third noble truth, but I think I am running out of time a little bit, so I'm going to stop fairly soon and invite some questions and comments because it's really important that we can talk about the practice and talk about where you're at and maybe how some of these things can be applied, whether in your daily life or in your meditation, or if anything I've said is confusing or you know you disagree with it, please um, raise it because it's really, really lovely to talk about these things. And I learn a lot through dialogue. But I did want to end just by um, saying one thing which really helped me during my Reigns retreat, because I, as I said, I had three months alone here. Um, first of all, I had to become content with the fact that I wouldn't be going to Perth where Ajahn Brahm is. He's my teacher and preceptor and, uh, and mentor. And um, usually I spend the three months Reigns retreat in his monastery. So I'm with this really impressive and very well-practicing Sangha of bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. And we're in the middle of the forest. You know, there are 300 acres of bush. It's absolutely still. There are, of course, the noises of the cockatoos and all the kind of nature, the natural noises. But the whole forest has a very, very um, ancient and wild and very still feel about it. I think one of the rock formations underneath um, that part of Western Australia is one of the oldest um, like, and biggest pieces of rock in the world. And it's just been stable for, I don't know, probably billions of years, I might have got that wrong, but it's, it's, and you can feel that, that sort of, um, uh, the ancient stillness in that land. So it's very, very conducive to practice, and uh, I had to give that up, you know, and, and just reconcile to the fact that I'd be in Oxford in this little vihara that we're renting, basically, it's a, per it's a temporary place. Um, but I found it unusually and surprisingly easy to develop contentment, perhaps because of the context of the global pandemic and just realising that I was so privileged and blessed to have somewhere to stay at all, you know, uh, that I had this opportunity to be, um, to live on Dana, even though people weren't able to come to my house. We arranged it so that people could send um, shopping every week, so people would um, take it in turns to send the groceries. And then I would have to put the food together because, of course, no one can come and look after me. So there is a, um, a kind of clause in the Vinaya that said that that's OK when in times of danger and difficulty and famine, actually. So the Buddha thinks ahead. <laughs> but um, I, it was really interesting to see that every time my mind wanted to complain, the, the loving kindness and contentment that was developing would just avert my mind from that negative direction and move it back into a place of contentment. You know, so I'd, I'd for example, have the thought, oh, it's nice here, but, you know, oh, normally I'd be able to see my bikini sisters, and then I'd be like, yes, and, 
you've got this wonderful food and you've got so much more solitude in this context even than you would have in Perth, you know. And so this contentment really developed. And Ajahn Brahm was very wise and at the beginning of the rains he told me, you know, just um, make sure that you take this three months as a holiday, like as a, as a real retreat and don't spoil it by setting goals. You know, don't have any notion about jhanas and enlightenment or any of that stuff. He said, make contentment your goal. And this was just the wisest piece of advice that came to me again and again during that time. Make contentment your goal. Because what happens if you make contentment your goal? You know, you can be content now. You can be content right away. Contentment, as I said, doesn't require things to be a certain way. The very point of contentment is that you value what's there, what's arising right now. So it keeps you in the present. It takes away any other kind of goal. And Ajahn Chah himself always said, you know, we meditate not to attain things, but to let go of things. Yeah, the path of practice is the path of letting go. So as we let go, it's a path of ever-increasing peace, ever-increasing joy, and the kind of happiness that is really worth pursuing, the happiness that arises from within. The Buddha called that happiness, the happiness of um, nekama, the happiness of letting go, nekama sukha. Paviveka sukha, the happiness of real solitude, solitude from even the five senses, the five hindrances of course, but even the five sense world. He called it the happiness of peace, upasama sukha, and the happiness of enlightenment, sambodhi sukha. And these were just definitions of the four jhanas, right? This is just along the way. So all these are available, starting with that happiness that comes from blamelessness, the blameless bliss of keeping the precepts, and the happiness of sense restraint, unblemished bliss. And then the happiness of deep samadhi, and finally the happiness of nibbana, the happiness that is really truly free from all wishes, all wants, any desire at all, the happiness that wants for nothing. <laughs> so, I hope something in there was of use and of benefit for all of you, and uh, thank you once again for having me here. I think now we're going to have some Q&A, um, and I think that this has been organised by Lushani and some other people who are here. So, um, as I understand it, the best way is probably to put your question in the chat box. I'm not sure if you should put it directly to Lushani. I think if you go into the chat box and you um, press on the person's name, then you get a choice of people. So, Lushani is one person in the list. The other thing you can do is go to the participants button and then you can find a little blue hand which will, well it says raise hand and then a blue hand will appear on your screen and we can unmute you to ask a question. But please bear in mind that if you ask the question yourself you will be recorded <laughs> because I had to be live streamed today. <laughs> a lot of letting go involved in that. <laughs> so you'll also have to let go of any, um, any uh, yes discomfort around that. If you're not able to do that, please ask it in the chat box, okay? So I'll, I'll hand it to Lushani. I think she's going to unmute herself. Is that right, Lushani? I can't see your face. But if you... Yes, you'll, you'll ask the question. Yes, I can hear you. Lovely. Okay, yeah. Pros and cons. Mm. I started with the Goenka practice and so for me I can say it was truly life-changing because it was the first time that I really came in contact with my own body and mind in that sort of setting which was tailor-made for solitude. I mean there was no possible distraction and I was ready for that somehow. Um, I really wanted to see what would happen in that in that situation, whether my mind would kind of uh, find a way to peace or whether it would go kind of mad. Or I really had no idea about Buddhism and no idea what to expect. I just knew that I needed to find out what was going on within myself because until then I'd been, um, I guess, always looking outside for meaning and not really finding that. 
Um, and I travelled a lot. I travelled a couple of years already in Asia and also in Israel. Uh, been to the top of the most beautiful mountain peaks. You know, had relationships. Been to the full moon parties. <laughs> And, you know, it was really strange, but it even felt to me like I had to have a lot of experiences quite early on, almost to rule them out, because part of me knew that that wouldn't lead to happiness, but I just needed to check it out and be sure. So I'd kind of come to the end of all that somehow, and I felt like the only solution now is to look inside my mind. And um, I found it incredibly helpful to start with body awareness because it brought me into the present. And so we would just do the body scan, going through the body and noticing the sensations and also noticing how they would change. So it developed a lot of equanimity in me. I was able to really stay with my experience and in a sense take responsibility for my experience because I saw that everything that was happening in my mind, thoughts about other people, memories from the past, I was responsible for it. No one else was around me at that time to cause my suffering. So I was responsible for all of that. And this was really fantastic. And also the emphasis on impermanence was fantastic because I realised that, you know, whatever arises in my body and mind, it's passing so quickly. You know, it literally, say, for example, um, there's a physical pain. At first it looks like pain. You know, you just see the coarse aspects of it. But after a while, when you stay with it, you see, oh, there's some pulsing there. There's some throbbing there. Oh, and there's also some temperature there as well. And you get really interested in it. And after a while, you can see that it's just changing all the time. And it's only our labels of pain that create this reaction. I don't want it. But when you're actually able to really stay with it and stay close to it, that reaction of I don't want it cannot really arise. And so it becomes very interesting and it's almost as though, because you see that it isn't solid, there's nothing really to react to. It doesn't stay long enough for you to react to it. And so it was the same with emotions too, because every emotion you can start to feel that it has a corresponding physical component in the body. So say if you're irritated or anxious, you'll feel it usually in the stomach, right? You might feel some sort of tightening or some butterflies. And if you can stay with that butterfly feeling, you know, and notice that it's changing and notice, oh, this is not me because there's something observing this. So this is, you know, it's not the whole picture. I don't have to react. Then that can translate into daily life as well. And so I found a lot more equanimity, a lot more um, stability and um, taking much more responsibility for my own happiness through that method. I would say in the long run, the downside for me was that it was very technique centric, so it was very much focused on that being the technique that can lead to enlightenment. And actually, it didn't have a lot of focus on samadhi as a base. So the samadhi that would develop would be the sort of um, what they call in the Abhidhamma and in the commentaries the, um, um, po oh, what do you call it now? I've forgotten the Pali word, but it basically means, oh, kanika samadhi, like momentary samadhi. So you're aware of things that are arising and passing. So the samadhi, the, the, the stillness can be quite constant, but it's aware of a moving object. Um, and I found that was difficult when then I wanted to develop deeper meditation because whatever I would focus on would be dissolving and would be changing all the time. So that was one difficulty. Um, and I guess the way that they taught Anapana was a little bit too forceful, so you had to constantly pull the, the mind back to the breath, back to the breath, and I just found that so difficult and really quite unpleasant for the mind, and it was only when I learned that samadhi was more like stillness than concentration. Actually, the translation for samadhi is much closer to stillness. Um, well, you can say sustained awareness too, but um, but concentration is really a bad translation. So then I started to actually enjoy um, the practice of breath meditation and focus a lot more on creating wholesome conditions than this struggle inside the mind. Um, and the other thing about the Goenka method is that unfortunately it is presented sometimes as being the one and only path. And I think that's a slight misunderstanding that the teachers nowadays have, especially the teachers in the West who haven't been around Goenka very much. Because the teachers I knew in, in the 90s um, who'd been closer to Goenkaji 
could see why he said that. What he was really saying was that Sila, Samadhi and Panya are the only path. And he was saying this in a Hindu country where they hadn't really come in contact with the Buddha's teaching for a long time. So actually he was saying this in a certain context, but that's been translated now, especially in the West, as to meaning the Vipassana method that he teaches is the only path. And this, of course, gives it quite a sectarian feel. So I think that's a danger, because then it means that you're not as able to cultivate various aspects of the path which might be appropriate for you. Like some people need to spend longer on samadhi, some people need to practice more loving kindness. It's different for everybody. And I think, you know, one of the signs of maturity in practice is that you learn to work with your mind in, in different ways and learn to apply different remedies at different times. Yeah? So just be careful of the narrowness that can happen, I think, with a particular um, tradition and method. So I hope that helped. Okay. Yeah. Two questions in one. Quite different questions because the first one was a lot more uh, <laughs> was a lot more um, intentional. Yeah, 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 yeah. No worries. I'll probably end up mixing it all up. Um, so the first one, the motivation was really a motivation to end suffering. Very clear, very, very clear for me. Like I knew at the age of 15 before I found the path that I needed to know why we're here, why we suffer, and what is a compassionate response to suffering. And I could, I could more or less articulate that to myself, but I had no idea that there was a path. I had no idea that there was such a thing as the Four Noble Truths. So when I first heard the Four Noble Truths, I was just, blown away I thought this is exactly what I always wanted to uh, to find and I felt so grateful to the Buddha because I felt that no one else was admitting the suffering of life you know people would say to me well what's wrong with you you know why do you suffer like why are you depressed why don't you want to just go to university and get married and have kids and have a nice job like everybody else and what could I say I just knew that that wouldn't solve the problem. Um, nothing against people who want to, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I felt like I needed to know myself much better first, and I needed to know why I was here and um, why there was so much suffering and so much hmm, power, greed, violence in the world, you know? So I kind of had a sense it was to do with our mind, because I went through a period of depression as a teen, so I kind of knew at that time that nothing outside can make me happy if my mind is, is unhappy. So that was why when I heard about the Vipassana retreat, I was just like, yes, this is what I have to do. So, um, and then my inclination to renounce, as I was saying in the talk, it just came gradually, you know, through that... Um, natural practice of virtue that started to happen automatically after my retreats it just became second nature not to harm and you know just to stop going to full moon parties or anything like that even listening to music I wasn't interested anymore because I just felt that I wanted to be more present to what was happening around me you know um, and I just didn't need it anymore somehow I felt much more centered within myself so it just felt very, very natural to want to keep on simplifying. Um, and I guess during those retreats, Goenkaji did used to talk about uh, renouncing. And uh, yeah, just how that would be such a noble thing to do. So I was asking around, I mean, this is, maybe I should have contextualised this by saying that I lived in Asia for many, many years. So, you know, in that context of being in India and Nepal and Burma, it's quite understood that renouncing, ordaining, is an option in life, right? It's a choice in life. You can be a lay person or you can be a renunciate. So it was all around me and it just felt like my path. So I say it was intentional, but in a way it was just a calling. 
So for 10 years I searched for an opportunity, but it did take 10 years to actually find one. <laughs> and in all that time I just continued to develop my practice and to, um, and to serve in the retreat centres because I felt that service was a really important part of developing the path. And also I intuitively sensed that I could become a bit obsessed with my practice unless I would think about others too. So I did a lot of retreats, a lot, in those ten years and um, finally found a place to ordain. So that was all sort of made a lot of sense to me. Um, the bit that didn't uh, come from me was the decision to come to England and decide to, um, I didn't decide, to start a monastery over here. So part of the renunciation for me that's always been really important is to have a teacher. I know that some people ordain and then they wander freely, they don't really stay under a teacher or maybe they don't have the fortune to have a good teacher, but for me I've always wanted that and um, I had a really exceptional teacher in Burma and then I came in contact with Ajahn Brown through some tape recordings that I listened to while I was still there. And I just knew that this is my teacher, very instinctive, emotional, deep response to his teachings. And they spoke to me where I was at at that time in the practice. Um, and so I went to Australia and ordained as a bhikkhuni there, because in Burma only the um, eight and ten precepts were um, possible. And still, for most women around the world, the full bhikkhuni ordination is not available. So when we say become a bhikkhuni, a lot of people mean become a nun because most of the time we can't become bhikkhunis. But luckily Ajahn Brahm had um, been a bit of a rebel and participated in some of the first bhikkhuni ordinations in the Theravada forest tradition. So I had the opportunity to, to make that commitment formal, let's say, because I don't think anybody ordains by halves. When you renounce, you renounce wholeheartedly and you give yourself to the path. You know, you don't think, I'm going to just half renounce or I'm just going to like semi-renounce. No, you renounce into whatever vehicle's available. So, um, luckily I had the opportunity to take the full bhikkhuni ordination in Perth, which just confirmed my commitment to the path. But it also carries a responsibility that perhaps I didn't realise at the time, which is also to help strengthen the bhikkhuni sangha because it has been... Um, weakened for so long. I don't want to say it's disappeared because it has been preserved in the Mahayana tradition. So we're reigniting it, we're trying to re-strengthen it. Um, and then, yeah, Ajahn Brahm asked me after about four years, or how long since I'd known him? Yeah, probably five or six years into training with him, he asked me to um, come to England and start something for bikinis here. So, because this is England and he's uh, originally from this country and actually came into contact with the Dhamma in England, and because, you know, I am his close disciple and he knows he can do whatever he wants with me, <laughs> he asked me to, um, to set something up. So I came over having no idea what was involved, basically, and I still don't really know what's involved. Um, um, but we started with uh, just trying to find people who were interested in joining the Trust and then trying to apply for charitable status, which we had in 2017. We got registered as a charity, and then in 2019 we rented our first base in England. So that's where I am now. It's a, a terraced house in Oxford. And we chose Oxford because it's not too far from London, it's quite accessible and yet it's out of the rush and the noise of a big city. It's a quite a pleasant place to be with a few different insight groups who invite me to teach from time to time. So um, it's just the beginning and unfortunately this year of course I couldn't really have any guests. So the whole thing, yeah, I feel, I feel like it was poised to take off a little bit more and to have a few more long-term guests and also we were going to invite a bikini from Perth to join me for a few months, just for a few months. But all that got cancelled, she was just about to book her flight and two days later she said, uh oh, it seems that, you know, everything's going into lockdown. So we missed out by about a week there. If she'd have booked it, if she'd have come a week earlier, she'd be stuck here now. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so it's small beginnings, but our long-term aim with the project is to have a training centre for women where they can take bhikkhuni ordination and also to have a monastery where 
all people of every gender, religion, race, background, whatever else can come and stay and um, experience the monastic lifestyle firsthand. So, and I think there's something very beautiful to that when you have a place which is residential because it fulfills the aspect of solitude and also service. So people coming will be able to serve and contribute to the community, serve the bhikkhunis or bhikkhuni at the moment, and um, also have time to practice in solitude in the afternoons and, um, of course, receive some teachings. So this is the long-term aim. Um, I think we need to stay closer to people for now in a smaller temporary base because, like I say, this year has been a little bit of a sort of gap. <laughs> Um, but then gradually when we have enough support, when we have enough help, because I'm still swamped in admin and all the things involved with running the project, um, when that changes then we'll be able to have a rural property with more space and hopefully in somewhere very pretty that you'll all want to come. So, so that's our project and of course the teachings as well, you know, I think our charitable constitution, our aims are to develop a place for where women can train and people can come and visit, but also to promote the teachings and practices of early Buddhism. So um, I try to, you know, talk about my experience in meditation, but also to refer it to the early Buddhist texts because, you know, it's so important to understand what the Buddha taught and to check our experience against those teaching so that we're on track we know we're on track and we know we're not uh, you know going off at tangents because it can be so easy to do that so yeah okay okay <laughs> I'll be quicker with the next ones okay Okay, great. First of all, hi Rebecca, it's so wonderful to have you. I know Rebecca from Perth, she also usually comes for the Rains Retreat over there and Rebecca's in, I think, Hong Kong now. She also is a big fan of teddy bears, we both do the teddy bear med meditation. <laughs> so lovely to have you here. Really lovely question, one of the things I wanted to discuss in a bit more depth that I had to skim over was gratitude, because I think gratitude is a proximate cause for contentment as well. If you cannot find that loving kindness, or if you find loving kindness hard to generate, then gratitude can be a really good way in. Because gratitude, again, is seeing what's there, rather than focusing on what's missing or what you'd like to have that you don't have. Yeah. So gratitude tends to be blind to the faults. Rebecca knows Ajahn Brahm's little phrase. He calls the mind which is with aversion the fault-finding mind, where you just see what's wrong with everything, with everyone, with every situation, and especially with ourselves, you know. Especially on a spiritual path sometimes that's the danger because we're looking to purify our mind and the first thing we notice is all the places that are impure, <laughs> you know, all the things that are wrong, the irritation, the impatience, etc. But if you look a little bit closer, that will probably only be a very small fraction of your mind and there'll be other qualities in there that you're just not noticing because you're not conditioned to see them. And we've been trained to look for the faults. It's actually called negativity bias in psychology and it's um, part of the way we're wired to avoid threat. But the thing is a lot of these things are not really threats at all so we don't need to obsess on our faults. And if we can just turn our mind towards what's, what there is to be grateful for, you know, first of all your intention to practice, this is something incredibly beautiful and precious. Yeah, I know that Re Rebecca has been practicing a long time and comes every year for the three month retreat and this is incredible. What a lot of commitment you have, you know. Can you really rejoice in that? Can you find some gratitude towards yourself and bring that up? Whatever else you've done during the day that's been of benefit to you or others, any small kind act, bring it up in your mind. It's called Chaganusati, reflecting on 
um, one's goodness and one's virtue. Bring that up in your mind. Be grateful for that. So we're starting to like lift and uplift our mind in ways that are encouraging, rather than in ways you know, rather than speaking to ourselves in critical ways. So reflecting on all those things, and like I say, during my retreat, I was focusing a lot on what I have to be grateful for. The fact that food was coming to my door twice a week, actually, from the supermarket and also from the um, organic vegetable box would come. And because my mind and heart were very soft and receptive, it would come to the door and I'd know to, I'd know to expect it. But still, my eyes would fill with tears of, of gratitude. <laughs> Just because it is such an incredible thing that there is so much kindness in the world, you know. So I think really reflecting on that and um, making a note of that. You can even write a gratitude journal. So at the end of every day or at the beginning of every day, you write down three things that you have to be grateful for. Yeah. So this helps you to become content with life and to focus on the beauty that you have there rather than what's missing. So I hope that helps, and I did promise to be a bit quicker with the questions, because I think there are a few more. There is no difference, I would boldly say, <laughs> except that the vinyana is obviously an aspect of the mind in the sense that the mind is conscious, right? I mean, the mind is not unconscious. The mind has to be conscious to exist. There can't be a mind that is unconscious, really. Otherwise, what's the point of that mind? So in the Diginikaya, I think it's the Brahma Jala Sutta, I think, the second one, the one on um, right views, or wrong views actually, all different wrong views. Um, the Buddha uses the term Mano Vinyana and Chitta as synonyms. So mind, mentality and consciousness. And of course these three are always translated slightly differently depending on the translator. Um, and some translators do like to differentiate and say that there's a subtle difference there, but I don't think it's very helpful to think in terms of a difference because I think there's a danger in um, reifying the mind and, and starting to see the mind as something that's sort of beyond the five candors and that's permanent and that exists in and of itself. And that can't be the case. I mean, if you think about it, if there's no vinyana, right, if there's no consciousness, then how can there be a mind? I mean, the Buddha also said that consciousness arises through contact with an object, right? So it's the, uh, it's the sense door coming in contact with its respective object. As a result, contact arises, and as a result, consciousness arises. Yeah? It only arises when the mind or the consciousness comes in contact with its respective object. Without that, it's not there. And the thing is, these things are very, very hard to see. I mean, I had a sense of this during the practice with um, Goenkaji because we focused so much on the arising and passing and you could really feel everything just dissolving constantly. But there was still a sense that the mind was always watching it. But I knew from my understanding of the Dhamma and from my teachers that that was still a delusion, that it was this permanent thing always watching it. And that even the Vinyana, even the mind, was actually arising and passing away. But I wasn't able to see that because my mind hadn't developed those deep states of samadhi that would be able to penetrate such a subtle thing. And so that was sort of really why I decided I think I need to almost like backtrack and, and stop seeing things in terms of impermanence and start to get deeper into samadhi so that I have a chance to penetrate the impermanent nature of the mind. I can't say I've done that yet. I mean, I have an inclination I'm pretty, you know, my view is such that I'm convinced that the mind is impermanent. But an Ajahn Brahm or somebody who's been practicing deep, deep jhanas for a long time, they can actually notice the different vinyanas, the different consciousnesses, including the mind consciousness, right? Because there's such a thing as mano vinyana, it's one of the six consciousnesses. He can see, or he says that, you know, one who comes out of those deep states of meditation can see that all these vinyanas are arising and passing constantly and that there's nothing kind of going across. If you read the book Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond that he's written, he explains this really beautifully. He has two different similes. One of them is the fruit salad simile. 
And he says it's like you have different fruits on a plate. So like you have the cauliflower and then you have a coconut and then you have an apple and then you... <laughs> and between the fruits is the, um, I think, the coconut. Anyway, that's the mind consciousness. So eye consciousness arises, then the mind consciousness, then nose consciousness, then mind consciousness, then eye consciousness, then mind consciousness. And the mind consciousness knows that the eye saw. The mind consciousness knows that the nose smelt. But it's not there at the same time. They're all there at different times. So I'm sure that I'm getting into territory which is beyond my own experience and I hope that the Bantes will forgive me if I'm getting anything wrong in terms of my view. But um, this is what I've understood from my teachers and the way that Ajahn Brahm explains it. That, um, you know, the Buddha was basically saying that Sabbe Sankara, Anatta, all conditioned things, including the mind, are Anatta, non-self. They're impermanent, they arise and pass away. So, so yeah, the mind is one of the six consciousnesses, mano vijnana, and that is subject to the laws of impermanence, suffering and non-self. Does that make sense? Let's, yeah... Okay, well, I think, first of all, making peace with the depression. Because when we say what helps with depression or what helps with sorrow or what helps with anger, we have to be really careful because sometimes what we mean is how do I get rid of the depression? How do I get over the depression? And again, as I was saying in the beginning, we have to first meet suffering in order to understand it. So it's completely natural to want to come out of depression, of course. You know, you want to move in ways that help you overcome that. But the way is not to um, reject or get rid of. The way is to make peace with the depression. So I would say, first of all, just really being very, very kind to yourself, you know, and and just learning to be able to be with that depression, that feeling of depression in the body and the mind. I mean, it might be a state which is quite intangible, which is sort of a bit cloudy and quite heavy and hard to really distinguish. So at that time, yeah, I mean, you can just practice with mindfulness and become more aware of the sensations in the body and the feelings in the mind. But I was always infuse that awareness with lots and lots of kindness. You know, to see if you can really um, observe your experience with a feeling of friendship and warmth. Almost as though somebody really loving, like a Buddha or like a teacher that you respect, is looking upon your experience with really kind eyes. So that person, if it's the Buddha or a friend or someone you respect and feel safe with, they're not judging you, they're not judging the depression. They're also not over-identified with it because it's not theirs. So if you can see your own depression in that way, just as a friend would see it, that can help get a little bit of distance and put in that loving, kind attitude towards it. Um, I would say also, like, really looking after yourself in daily life, like getting enough sleep, not having expectations of yourself to perform as usual. That's really important. Talking to people, telling them that you're depressed, being vulnerable, being open about it, and asking for support. And then if you sometimes feel able, you know, to meditate and you can do it without too much um, pressure, I would say practice loving kindness towards yourself or even practice loving kindness towards someone who you find easier than yourself, you know. So come to some meta groups. They're usually quite uplifting. I do a meta group every other Saturday and uh, we go through the various categories of beings. So sometimes we start with ourselves, and then we spread metta to the loved person and the neutral and the difficult person. And metta itself, even if you're not having overwhelming feelings of love, it can really soften um, the negativity, the sadness, the aversion that's in the mind. Because depression is a kind of low energy state and it's a state of negative, it's a sort of negative state. Yeah, so wherever you can add some kindness 
either in the way you look at that state, the way you relate to that state, or by the actual practice of loving kindness. I think this can be of help. But please just remember that your aim is not to get rid of it, your aim is to be kind to it. Okay? Okay. Uh, information. Okay. So I think Lushani is going to pop in some links into the chat box and she'll probably put in there our events page, which is how you can attend our sessions. We also sometimes talk about how you can help in those sessions. There's also a sign up to our newsletter on our website. And so you'll be able to hear um, what we're doing in terms of teaching and other activities. And also sometimes in there we write about particular volunteer positions that might come up. Um, generally speaking, we need volunteers with time because we've got a lot of volunteers working remotely who don't have a lot of time. And so if somebody's only got, say, an hour or two hours a week, sometimes it's more for me to communicate with them. It's at least one or two hours a week. <laughs> then it's um, sometimes it doesn't actually alleviate the work. So what we really need are some people who have a lot of time. Um, and then there may be various jobs coming up that are a bit more substantial. Um, there are other ways to help, like contributing food and other requisites that we might need. Um, obviously, helping us to fundraise, so you can, you know, you can offer dana. Um, again, in terms of requisites or in terms of donations to our um, charity, and they look after my needs, and we also save. We're trying to save up in order to buy a place in the countryside for our permanent place. Um, and yeah, hopefully Lushani can put that one in the box as well. That's just anocamperproject.org slash donate. Yeah, she's put the general one. So slash donate for donations slash events for events. I'm sure you can find it all out on there. So, and every, every contribution is so welcome. So please do get in touch if you do want to help in any way, because you never know, we may have something just for you. <laughs> thank you thank you so much and thank you to the venerables for having me today thanks to everyone for coming